Welcome to Silicon Valley Health Institute. We bring world leader uh, experts to talk about health. We're a nonprofit organization. You can learn more about us as well as see all of our videos on our website, Silicon Valley Health Institute. That's www.svhi.com. You can join our meetup. You can get on our email list to learn about the next speakers coming up. So today we've got Dr. Laszlo Boros, and he's going to talk to us about um, heavy hydrogen, uh, et cetera, in transitional medicine. He holds a doctor of medicine degree from the Albert Sense Georgi School of Medicine, sorry about the pronunciation, in, in Hungary. He is currently a professor of pediatrics, endocrinology, and Metab metabolism at the UCLA School of Medicine, and he's an investigator at the UCLA Clinical and Translational Science Institute. He's also the chief scientific advisor of SIDMAP LLC. He studies functional biochemistry for phenotype as well as drug testing that involves library screening, lead optimization in vitro and in vivo um, uh, profiling. The core technology involves studying the net steady state and disease drug induced variations and stable non radiating isotope variations uh, via crosstalk among metabolic metabolites and 13C glucose or deuterium as labeling substrates. He is the co-inventor of the targeted 13C tracer <coughs> fate association platform to study deuterium on an on coisotope and its depletion by mitochondrial matrix water exchange reaction to prevent own coisotopic cell transformation by deuterium. He's trained as a house staff in his medical school in gastroenterology after receiving research training and a fellowship from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. He was a visiting scholar at the Essen School of <coughs> Medicine in Germany and also worked as a research scientist <coughs> at the Ohio State University Department of Surgery. Is recipient of the Williams Hall Outstanding Publication Award from the Academy of Surgical Research in the United States and the Richard E. Wiseman Memorial Research Award from the University of California for his excellence in clinical research. <clears throat> anyway, <coughs> also co-hosting here is Stephanie Seneff. She's a senior researcher scientist at MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She's a BS degree MIT in biology and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science. She's published over 200 peer reviewed papers in scientific journals and conference proceedings. Recent <coughs> interests have focused on the role of toxic chemicals, micronutrient deficiencies, and health and disease. She has a special emphasis on the pervasive herbicide Roundup and its component glyphosate, and also focuses on the mineral sulfur and its uh, contribution to our health. She's authored over two dozen peer-reviewed journal papers over the last few years on these topics and has delivered, delivered numerous cell presentations around the world. So welcome, Stephanie. I will now let you take over. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, Laszlo, for being here. I hope we will have a very educational uh, experience for people. I think that deuterium uh, to me is a, an incredible thing that I only learned about in 2000, December of 2019, thanks to you. Um, so happy that you reached out to me because I've just been really fascinated by this uh, atom and the con and its effects on our health and how it uh, interacts with other toxic elements to uh, to mess up our mitochondria. So I think you should start. Uh, I'd like you to start by just introducing deuterium, what it is, and why you think it's something we should be worried about. Uh, thank you so much, and and thank you for moderating uh, the lecture today. Uh, this conversation uh, about deuterium. And uh, thank you for taking uh, my call uh, in 2019 talking about deuterium. And it was um, a initiative practically by Dr. Dorsman who wanted me and you to talk about these particular scenarios simply because she knew your research and my research was very um, interacting or interacting with your initiative. So, uh, and thank you so much for, for everybody joining in uh, for this uh, uh, talk about deuterium. We, we did have exchange 
uh, very important information about lithium with Dr. Seneff. And uh, I'm just gonna cover the basics uh, for everybody who is uh, new to the topic. Um, as we all know that hydrogen is the smallest element on our planet and in the universe. And it's also the most common one. And it's also the most common element or atom in all living organisms. And it's actually the, the one that carries the load of moving proteins and, and being active in chemical reaction. For example, in hydrogen bonds, uh, reductive synthesis, when there's a hydrogen needed for uh, generating energy in the mitochondria, those are also very uh, critical to supply our cells with um, energy. And these are proton exchange reactions uh, that we have learned in chemistry and biochemistry medical school. Now, uh, this particular isotope, hydrogen, or the most common isotope of, of, of hydrogen is the proton. Um, uh, and it has one positive charge and it's isotopic brother or it's stable isotope, um, deuterium is much larger than hydrogen is. And people would say that this is probably something that we can neglect simply because it's, it's that deuterium is really not as common as some other stable isotopes, but the, the, the difference between hydrogen and deuterium because of the size, because of the structure of the nuclei, um, it, it's, 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 it's dramatic. And, and this is what biology, biochemistry, medicine, and translational research now is uh, taking advantage of knowing about this isotope effect. The, the nucleus of hydrogen it contains a proton. Proton is the smallest um, nuclear, nuclear, nuclei of a atomic element that is movable, that is stable, that stays uh, on Earth or in the universe forever. Um, deuterium is, is a, a proton and a neutron, which is actually just as large, just as big as hydrogen prot proton itself. So it, it actually increases the weight and the nuclear size of, of hydrogen by 100%. So it doubles its weight, it, it doubles its size. And because of this particular and large increase in, in mass and in size, they just don't fit. They just don't really uh, perform as hydrogen would in chemical reactions and in, in, in moving proteins and, and delivering energy to the cells. And worse there is, these deuterium bonds are much more stable than hydrogen bonds. They are eight to 15 times harder to break. Uh, they stabilize structures. They change the conformation of, of uh, uh, chemicals just like proteins and, and, and nucleic acids with nucleotides, uh, DNA mostly. And, and because of this heavy and large uh, constituent or the, the contribution of deuterium to, to molecular elements in a large scale, we call it an alkyl-isotope. We know DNA structural changes are very imminent in the presence of deuterium. And it's actually toxic after a certain concentration in all living systems. So because of it, this dramatic difference, which is really unique in nature, there's no other element that would has that would have a an isotopic brother as large as as dramatically bigger and heavier than, uh, for example, hydrogen is which is kind of the moving part in, in all chemical reactions, it seems that biological systems are trying constantly to deplete, to get rid of deuterium, especially not to let deuterium get into the mitochondria or the mitochondrial matrix for that matter. And it's a, it's a <clears throat> constant quest of our biochemistry reactions. This is why we have so many of them to actually check every every hydrogen or every potential deuterium site in any chemical or any biomolecule uh, just to protect our most 
valuable, or I would say the most sensitive uh, compartment in our cells, that's the mitochondrial matrix, where a lot of hydrogens, a lot of protons are transferred because deuterium being twice as large, twice as heavy, behaves as a bow in the china store when it comes to mitochondrial functions, especially nanomotor functions. But again, protein peptide structures are also, and DNA structures are also affected by deuterium availability. So it seems like uh, our biochemical reactions that we know conventionally in medicine or what we learn in medical school, they are all there with a few exceptions to actually uh, exchange hydrogens from cellular water on biomolecules that eventually will carry hydrogens into the mitochondria to generate energy for our cells. So it's, it's uh, just to sum it up very quick, hydrogen and deuterium, these, these are isotopic pairs. They participate in the same chemical reactions or they try to participate in the same chemical reactions or they take place in forming structures in our cells but deuterium is being twice as heavy and twice as large considering its nucleus, it's actually a very damaging uh, atomic component or, or, or a structure in our system. So for that reason, it seems that we have to control the level of deuterium in our food and our uh, uh, liquids we consume as much as possible. So to assist ourselves to get rid of deuterium, practically we have to limit the intake one way or another. And we'll explore this, I guess, in the talk later, but that's practically what is so dramatic about deuterium. I think it's um, very interesting about these people in upper, in Siberia who uh, live a really long time and it took a while for the uh, medical community to figure out why they were so healthy. I think that's a nice place to start in terms of how much deuterium is in, is there in nature? Where is there less? And how does that impact our health? And both in the water, in the air, in the, in the food, you know, just sort of the distribution of deuterium and the things that we're exposed to, to give a sense of how significant is it, maybe compared to other things like calcium too in our blood. Uh, yeah, it, when I was a kid, we were watching the TV dance show and there was actually a dance team from uh, the Caucasus region of Russia uh, and the young dancer was 115 years old. So uh, it, was, it was kind of, you know, just dramatic just to see how different the ages and their, their physical appearance of these people, and practically this is because they live at high altitudes and the team does not make it uh, in those uh, faunas or biological systems. So after all, it seems like higher and farther we live from the oceans where most of the tutum is in, in water, in oceanic water, uh, longer we live, healthier we live, and, and in general, we are just uh, happier. Uh, and this is what now is known as a biological phenomenon. But the answer to this question is practically what you just uh, named is that practically the, the, the deuterium in the environment is a, is a very important factor of quality of life and the length of life and uh, disease-free life. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I know there's a paper that showed a correlation between depression and deuterium, a very interesting paper uh, in the United States. I don't know if you know about, you must know about this paper, you know, different states yeah, that, and how much deuterium. Paper, <clears throat> from, from Oxford, but they studied the water content of the 50 states of the United States. I think 49 states had data on uh, uh, water, con water deuterium content and uh, anxiety, depression correlated with the water content of, of those particular geographical areas. And it's also true with cancer, diabetes, and chronic uh, degenerated diseases. It seems that uh, um, more water there is in the environment in the form of water and food. Well, water content would determine the deuterium content of the crops and the yield and uh, the uh, food <clears throat> that is grown um, uh, in um, either the farm or the 
the agriculture of the pastures, pra practically the pastures, practically it depends on how much water there is, how much decrim there is in water, rainwater that determines the decrim content of our food. And indeed, uh, measuring, getting the, um, the US uh, of, um, agriculture and, and geographical distribution of decrim, this is how diseases seem to be chronic, uh, uh, debilitating in some cases, scenarios like Alzheimer's and so on. It seems that they match the decrim content of the water. And this particular paper from the Oxford University discussed this in detail. And I think it's a very insightful paper for that matter. Yeah, so I think it's very interesting that the things that you taught me about metabolism and you are an expert on, on you know, the glycolysis pathway and the citric acid cycle and and how deuterium moves around within that whole metabolic system. And it's quite uh, amazing in the work you've done where you've been able to put deuterium, uh, supply a deuterium loaded um, nutrient to a system and then follow where the deuterium ends up. Uh, you've done work on that, others have as well. And it's just really quite fascinating how uh, you can see that some enzymes that don't make a lot of sense uh, why is it doing this? It looks like it's just wasting time. And there's really good reason why it's doing it, such as these isomerases. So if you could talk some about the metabolic pathways, that would be great. Sure. Um, so the work started by Dr. Gabo Shomia, who is a good colleague and a good friend of mine, um, back in the 1990s. And before his work, there were two models in the medical literature who addressed some biochemical phenomenon that are related to nanomotor functions, moving proteins and moving uh, hydrogen, moving protons in, in living systems. But Gabor Shomia was the first who addressed this deuterium depletion issue using water. <laughs> and he included cancer cells in, in cultures and also in animals and he started uh, performing and, and running clinical studies with the water in cancer patients. And we did a study together in 2004, which we published in 2005 and 2006, showing that in fact, in three different cell lines, in uh, <clears throat> cancer cell lines, in the tumor depleted environment, these cell lines changed their, their metabolic phenotype dramatically that affects glycolysis and the mitochondria. But at that time, it was um, not um, connected or linked with mechanisms that are precisely kind of tweeted out from the biochemical network. We just noted practically the effect of the human metabolism and how beneficial it is when it comes to uh, treating cancer. Uh, and in 2009, I got a phone call from the National Cancer Institute of the United States where there was actually a kidney cancer patient who had one genetic mutation in the mitochondria and that was fumarate hydratase. It was a point mutation in an enzyme that recycles metabolic water or matrix water in the mitochondria and the patient died very quick. So the tumor showed a very aggressive uh, phenotype or biological okay. behavior. So that, that's when I, I, I thought of this my matrix water or uh, mitochondrial um, metabolic water has to be between depleted because we, show, we saw the same effect one day that restored the one of uh, the NCI team, uh, Dr. Linehan's team, restored the VAD type fumarate hydratase, which was one of the enzymes. Uh, Dr. Albert St. Jordi, my medical school, uh, received the Nobel Prize in 1937. This enzyme adds metabolic water to the Krebs uh, cycle, Krebs St. Jordi cycle intermediate, so it recycles the fume depleted water. Um, into the into metabolism, and from then on, we started kind of looking in the cell just to see exactly where there are enzymes that exchange uh, water hydrogen with uh, hydrogen that come in 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 molecules that we consume uh, 
more, in most particular, it was glucose that we were interested in. And uh, sure enough, um, glycolysis has 10 reactions. It's simply because we have 12 hydrogens in glucose that come in and glycolysis would check, replace every hydrogen or deuterium, <clears throat> even though deuterium is, is, is a very rare stable isotope, but our glycolysis would still check it. So if you approach a complex, complex metabolic channel like glycolysis from the deuterium, deuterium point of view, then you can find out exactly those uh, reactions that I summarize uh, uh, hexose as like glucose into fructose and then uh, glyceraldehyde into dehydroxyacetone phosphate. You know, those are I summarize reversible reactions and they change, exchange hydrogen with deuterium very rapidly and enolase takes out a whole water molecule of, of, of glucose. So practically by the time you get down to pyruvate or pyruvic acid, all those hydrogens have been replaced by metabolic water um, deriving uh, hydrogen. And if there was a deuterium on this glucose molecule, it will be gone by the time you generate pyruvic acid provided that your metabolic water is deuterium depleted or your cellular water or cytoplasmic water is deuterium depleted. And um, the same is, is true with the TCA cycle. It has nine reactions to generate uh, citric acid from oxalacetate and acetylcarnazam. I'm just talking about the catabolic arm of the cycle. And, and, and it's the same idea. It's, uh, it, it replaces uh, potential deuterium sites or deuterium uh, from intermediate metabolites of the TCA cycle just to make sure that the hydrogen that is going to be picked up by nicotine adenine, adenine dinucleotide NAD and carries it to the electron transport chain to actually move the protons into the intermembrane space of the mitochondria, those are not deuterium because deuterium would actually break these very delicate nanomotors that let protons to come back into the matrix and form metabolic water with the help of oxygen. And this is why we breathe in oxygen to supply our cells with an oxidizing agent. In this case, it's oxygen that can oxidize hydrogen and form water for that matter. And, and uh, that has to be deuterium depleted or without deuterium when it comes to mitochondrial matrix operation. And so that, uh, yeah, it seems biochemistry is very complicated or complex for that matter, but it has a purpose, as you mentioned, it's practically just to replace every potential deuterium coming into the cell using nutrients which are not um, grass-fed source or not ketogenic uh, uh, source, meaning that they have already a low deuterium um, environment or they have a low deuterium content and they are safe for the mitochondria. That's what we, that's what we expect from fatty acids. It's because they are formed from citrate in nature and uh, the citrate is always part of the mitochondrial metabolic network, which is deuterium depleted in the first place. So, so for that matter, it's, it is a very simple task using very complicated metabolic reactions and, and networks, but it's practically just to remove the tumor potentially from every metabolite that makes it into your cells. Thank you. Yeah, and the thing that I started playing around with once I sort of understood the game well enough was to look at where enzymes do their thing. So if some enzymes are active in the mitochondria and some of them are in the cytoplasm, other ones are in the ER. I mean, there's various places where these enzymes do their thing. And when you start to think about like cholesterol metabolism and how complicated it is, because there's this specialized cholesterol transporter that brings cholesterol into the mitochondria, and then the cholesterol gets oxidized, it gets modified, and then it gets taken out of the mitochondria and then other things happen to it. It's like, the, why is the cell obsessed with moving, you know, complicated, makes life much more complicated for itself than it needs to be. Uh, why does it do this? And I actually was really puzzled by that early on before I knew anything about deuterium. 
once I know about deuterium, it makes so much more sense. You know, of course you get in trouble because these transporters are broken and then you, you can't metabolize cholesterol and you get sick. So it, it's a very complicated system that seems much more complex than it needs to be. But once you realize that the, the, the cell is really obsessed on making sure as much as possible that deuterium doesn't make its way into that metabolic water uh, in, the, um, in the mitochondria because, and because it will wreck the ATPase pumps. And that you have some nice uh, pictures of the ATPase pumps with uh, the deuterium, big muscular deuterium molecule, atom coming in there and wrecking the pump. You know, it's, it's very graphic. And, um, and I certainly learned that lesson. And, I, and now when I look at all these, um, you know, the whole system that metabolizes the steroid, steroids, you know, cholesterol and vitamin D and all the sex hormones, that's one whole group. And then there's um, the tryptophan, the aromatic amino acids and everything that's derived from them, the neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, melatonin, adrenaline, um, adrenochrome, all those things are like a cascade of reactions with um, interesting, um, activities that are geared towards, I think, also supporting the deuterium depleted water in the mitochondria. So it's really quite fascinating. And I know there are these enzyme classes I mean, exactly how do you deplete deuterium? And it's actually a, a, a very tricky biophysics um, aspect to the whole system, where the, uh, which you could probably talk about with uh, proteins like the flavoproteins. You, you can look, find papers that talk about something called the kinetic isotope effect for deuterium versus hydrogen. And you can find uh, enzymes that specialize in favoring hydrogen over deuterium by various amounts. And the, and the reports will tell you by how much. And so when you find a, an enzyme that knows how to not pick deuterium and refuse to do the reaction if there's a deuterium sitting there, uh, it's really fascinating because it's making sure then that the product is gonna be pure. And I think you could talk a bit about the physics of the um, proton tunneling, that sort of thing that uh, deuterium is not good at. And that's how the, the enzyme makes use of that in the way it's designed. Yeah, so my uh, clarification of this whole process came from Dr. Abdullah Olgan, who wrote a great paper in 2007, I believe, uh, talking about the ATP synthase nanomotors and the, the effect of deuterium um, uh, making these, these ATP synthase nanomotors kind of just dysfunctional practically for that matter. And then <clears throat> we visualize this, uh, this process. I, I do work with a number of, of informatics and, and visual graphics design. Esther Burst is one of the uh, contributors to this field. Actually, she designed this nanomotor that has this deuterium that comes in and breaks it practically. So those are very helpful uh, visual aids if somebody is learning about these, these nanomotors, simply just to know how they are in, interacting with these uh, very delicate protein and, and, and amino acid binding sites of, of, of hydrogens that actually uh, power and, and uh, uh, um, turn these nanomotors around to synthesize ATP. Um, uh, in our cells, and and this practically a the 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 most important I would say uh, as far as translational medicine goes to understand this process and how robust it is. Uh, there are now uh, uh, there are now radiologists who are actually studying the effect of of deuterium. They label either um, uh, contrast agents or they label food for example, glucose to get deuterium into the cells and uh, find out how they can characterize the uh, radiological uh, image forming ability of deuterium in cells. And surprise, not surprisingly to us, uh, if you provide deuterium for the cells using um, glucose, for example, all that deuterium will end up in water because your cells will get rid of deuterium no matter how you try to uh, incorporate deuterium into, into the moving parts of the cells. Uh, very little gets of deuterium gets into intermediate metabolites, but most of the deuterium, deuterium will end up in metabolic water after all. And for that matter, this has to be a very robust system that labeling is practically from glucose to water is constant, uh, time dependent and linear. 
and, and really robust, meaning that our cells uh, primarily will get rid of deuterium if it comes through food um, in, in a very complex biochemical set of reactions, but it's to make things simpler for the mitochondria and to preserve these nanomolar functions. So it's complex and complicated uh, because deuterium has a, um, a different binding characteristics to proteins if, if, or amino acids. Uh, deuterium binds to amino acids that carry a negative charge uh, simply because deuterium, just like protons, they have positive charges and they have one single positive charge. So they bind to amino acids that are on the surface of, of these nanomotors and they break them simply because at the rotation at these very high velocity where these nanomotors are spinning, which is somewhere around eight to 9,000 uh, rotations per minute. And some bacteria use these nanomotors even at 45 rotations per minute, like a turbo pump or some sort. You can imagine if you, throw a rock in there, they practically just kind of shatter and they start sparing and they just become non-functional. And for that matter, the tomb stays on the same side of the, of the cellular membrane simply because they can't cross through the membrane. They can't really use these nanomotors to, to, to cross membranes. And the cells are trying to limit, limit the, the, the deuterium load to water, metabolic water that is generated in the cytoplasma through these uh, reversible uh, reactions that are isomerases. And this is what has been described in late 1800s by a uh, Dutch scientist, uh, Lover de Bun, who was the first who, with these uh, adose ketose transformations, he clarified that. Actually, when you change an autos uh, sugar to a ketose sugar, you transfer the proton through water. So it's not one proton jumping from the first carbon of glucose to the second carbon. I'm just giving you an example, but it's actually dropping the proton into the water pool and the water will provide, the cellular water or the cytoplasmic water will provide the proton for the second carbon when there's this isomerization. So. <clears throat> so practically, this process is very sophisticated, very robust, very elaborate, and you can now see papers that detail and give you a clinical scenario of what to expect as far as labeling uh, nutrients with deuterium, where the deuterium will end up. Uh, it's going to end up in water because this is where the hydrogen comes to replace deuterium. So. <clears throat> and these are very linear, very robust, uh, very time dependent uh, processes in our cells. So we've been right from the beginning. Uh, we just didn't have all the data yet. <clears throat> but our models, Dr. Olgren's models, uh, <clears throat> and the clinicians who work with um, victim depletion, they can, <clears throat> they can tell how cellular phenotypes, high disease processes are affected by it. So, <clears throat> it, it is, after all, just a complete story or, or getting complete at, at our end. And we are the biochemists, so we clarify these reactions. But it, 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 it worked out very nicely from the hypothesis, from the modeling, and, and to the experimental phase, and now in the clinical and translational phase, because that's what the radiologists are finding. Um, the team ends up in. Uh, cellular water, and they can measure it using uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. So it's becoming a, uh, once they figure out the details, it's becoming a diagnostic uh, uh, field in medicine. I think it's very interesting. For me, I was kind of getting puzzled because if the, if the me metabolic molecules that are being made as nutrients are depleted in deuterium, deuterium doesn't go away, so it's going to be more concentrated in the water. And yet the mitochondria are making deuterium depleted water. So it sort of doesn't make sense. And what I am suspecting is that uh, it's a distinction between gelled water and liquid water. And this is Gerald Pollock's work where you have a lot of sulfates, for example, in the extracellular matrix. So the, the, um, the blood is lined with this 
gelled water that's maintained by the sulfates in the glyco glycosaminoglycans. And the, um, that gelled water, um, you know, it's, it's exclusion zone water. Uh, Gerald calls it exclusion zone water. It excludes. And one of the things that it, it excludes lots of things, it kind of makes a pure, I, I, call it, I like to call it liquid ice, you know, a pure gel, like jello. I mean, jello is, in fact, gelled water. And um, the body has lots of gelled water. And of course the blood has to flow so it can't be gelled. So that, that's another kind of very tricky situation that, met, that a, an organism faces as to how to keep the blood flowing, um, not gelling the blood, but gelling the lining so that the red blood cells can slip through the capillaries effortlessly because you just have this slick jello surface instead of having all these molecules dangling out in there, impeding its progress. But I suspect that the gelled water is trapping deuterium. And I expect that's also very, very important in the gut because you have a lot of sulfomucins that line the gut barrier. And those I believe are gonna trap deuterium, leaving behind liquid water that is deuterium depleted. So that is, I think, a very important mechanism by which the body starts out, whatever it eats, whatever it drinks, that deuterium gets trapped in the gel, in the gut lining. And then the fluid water, that's what, where the met 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 metabolites are being made by the bacteria is uh, depleted in, in, uh, in deuterium because it's trapped in the gel. And that makes sense to me because the, the gel actually pushes protons out to the surface and creates a battery. And it's, I think a deuteron is gonna be much more reluctant to leave because it binds more strongly because it's heavier. It's not as mobile. So it won't be as inclined to leave the, the gel. And therefore that is a natural first step towards uh, trapping the deuterium in the gut wall such that it doesn't get into the main system. And that's a great way to start off with deuterium depleted water. Do you agree with that or? Yeah, the, the, so mitochondria are very tricky because they don't really have bulk water. They only have this gel kind of water. They only have surface water. And there are studies back in the 60s, 70s, they use this neutron scattering technology when they actually shave neutrons and they, try to find out uh, what is the scattering pattern and water characteristics when it comes to uh, <clears throat> water structure or structural water in, in cellular organelles. And mitochondria has only surface water or, or uh, structural water. So if you get a mitochondria and you shake it, uh, um, then you don't hear anything moving in there simply because all the water is structurally bound to proteins and, and uh, those proteins are the hydrophilic components of the membranes the crypt, the, the, the mitochondrial membranes, they are hydrophobic. So there's a lot of things that can happen to protons uh, and those are actually nuclear magnetic and nuclear physics uh, type of changes. So we're not gonna go into those, but I do agree with you. And, and I do uh, <clears throat> agree with this structure water scenario that if uh, deuterium would get into mitochondria, then it would actually alter the physical behavior of, of the structural water that mitochondria have. And I think, I believe that mitochondria or the urea cycle is practically one particular cycle that uses nitrogen's ability to bind deuterium more efficiently than hydrogen. And it takes deuterium mm -hmm. loaded water out from the mitochondrial matrix <clears throat> as one of its main purpose. So I think that mitochondria are protected in many different ways. Glycosis is one way of uh, making sure no glucose or no sugar takes uh, deuterium into the mitochondrial space. And also the, the mitochondrial metabolism is also designed by these cycles to get rid of deuterium before it gets into structured water. Because once it gets into structured water, and you're right, um, you actually have to use a diamond head to break the kind of the, the, the closest layer of water, uh, of, of uh, structured water. So it's, it's practically like ice and uh, <clears throat> with some flexibility. It's a very thin ice in that sense. But, um, but uh, deuterium can actually do a huge damage to structured water and, and their chemical 
behavior simply because it has a different binding characteristics. And there was a uh, German team who showed this in, in ICE practically. Um, one deuterium can affect the tunneling of a thousand photons around it, meaning that it's like a football game when you throw a medicine ball in there and the players just don't know what to do with it. So they just kind of fall over it. They don't move together. The ball is not moving and that's what deuterium is. So it's very destructive of all uh, cellular uh, processes. Uh, and I think deuterium is, is delivering the most damaging uh, effect uh, in mitochondria or in cell structures when it comes to structural water. Mm -hmm. And because mitochondria has only structural water or interfacial water, the effect of deuterium in mitochondrial morphology and, and functions is just uh, devastating. But I, I very deeply agree with you. This is a very critical element of understanding mitochondrial functions and, and water interactions in living systems. And the other thing that I found fascinating was the idea that the um, gut, you know, the gut microbes produce a lot of gases and they, they have the capability of producing hydrogen gas and um, methane and hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, all of those gases uh, will be released in your gut. And then those gases are typically brought back into metabolic space through other microbes that can convert them back into organic mo molecules. And so for example, methane goes to methanol, goes to formaldehyde, goes to formate. You get this, um, each of those reactions is a uh, dehydrogenase, which is a uh, flavoprotein, which can select for hydrogen over deuterium. And by the time you get done, you're sort of um, piling onto NAD, NAD plus, you're piling on these healthy H's. So these, these enzymes that the bacteria have that take the methane, which is CH4, and eventually those H's on that methane get attached to NAD plus to make NADH. And we're using enzymes that are clever, that know how to use uh, proton tunneling to, to, to let, not let deuterium end up on the, on the NAD. So those um, enzymes are producing very valuable NADH, supplying it to the host for all those reactions that take place where that H is like has a guarantee attached to it that it's not gonna be D. And I think those enzymes, those flavoproteins are, are getting messed up by glyphosate. This is, a, this is why I got so excited about the deuterium because you end up with a lot of gases in your gut, you know, sort of bloating and discomfort. And at, and at the same time, you're not able to generate those very valuable NADH molecules that are gonna be able to feed hydrogen into the, uh, into the mitochondria. Uh, that's right. We, we have been using uh, deuterium and deuterium labeled water uh, <clears throat> as a labeling substrate for, uh, uh, to reductive carboxylation and synthesis. For example, we <clears throat> with Dr. Pauli at uh, UCLA, who was my mentor and uh, uh, a very dear colleague of mine, unfortunately he passed away uh, two and a half years ago. But uh, <clears throat> we did use deuterium with uh, biologic in biological systems just to label various metabolites. You can label methane, you can label uh, fatty acids, you can label glucose, you can label anything with deuterium label water simply because they interact, they, they participate in metabolism and product synthesis so actively that uh, you can actually label more efficiently with water uh, in comparison with labeling substrates with deuterium itself, because that will end up in water. So if you wanna label metabolites, it, it's better if you start out with water because water is trying to replace deuterium, but if the water has deuterium, it's gonna replace hydrogen. So practically every gut element, every bacteria that fight for these heavy stable isotopes to grow, um, they would retain deuterium. The hydrogen gas production is one of the most important uh, deuterium depleting phenomena in these uh, bacteria simply because we know how important hydrogen is and we know how important deuterium is for bacteria yeast to grow. And this is their growth factor. They mm -hmm. retain the 
purpose. So their nuclei, their DNA material becomes unstable and they keep dividing as long as there are substrates in the team for that purpose. And in that scenario, they do a big favor to us mm -hmm. as a eukaryotic cell. We harbor a lot of eukaryotic cells, but they deplete the film for us. And it starts as soon as we start chewing, chewing our food and it, bacteria get to them, this whole process start immediately. And then when the glucose is absorbed, for example, uh, from uh, from gut into the circulation, then our red blood cells take over and they use the pentocycle and uh, they use glycolysis to produce lactic acid. In the meantime, they uh, carry oxygen and they use the um, deuterium depleting potential of glycolysis to generate lactic acid that is low in deuterium. And then the core cycle or uh, lactic acid can go back to the, the gut bacteria, uh, especially in trained athletes who produce a lot of lactic acid. They, instead of using the core cycle, which is kind of bouncing glucose and lactate between muscle and liver cells, they actually bounce lactate uh, between muscle cells and the gut back and gut bacteria. And oh, that's they, interesting. And they, they produce them a propionic acid, which is a ketone body, practically a deuterium between the ketone body. And this is how marathon runners can run 24 or 42 kilometers, depending on, on uh, if you run a half marathon or full marathon, but practically that's how they train. They feed their lactic acid to their gut bacteria, which deplete them and pumps propionic acid and butyrate back to the circulation, which are deuterium depleted ketogenic uh, right. substrate, the ketone bodies that preserve their mitochondrial nanomotors, so they are able to run, run long distances in a fairly short time. I think the fastest marathon is like over a little bit over two hours. Maybe they are now less than two hours, but that's 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 a huge deal for athletes to be able to run that distance. And we know what happened to the guy who ran the marathon the first time, which was in Greek times, in war times. He actually just ran back from the field and he announced that they won the war and he died. Uh -huh. now, so now if you train yourself and you teach your uh, gut bacteria how to deplete the tumor from lactic acid, and there are actually specialized bacteria for that particular purpose. And you can grow that population out. If you train enough, then you don't die after running the marathon. <laughs> so they are just going to, but the first guy died of, of the Greek uh, soldier who ran the distance between the battlefield and his uh, little town. Uh, he died, but now you can do this with the appropriate training and the diet. You can actually preserve, pretend, uh, uh, protect your mitochondrial animal. Yeah, well, so what I think is that the gut bacteria serve an incredibly important role in helping to supply the host with deuterium depleted nutrients. And then they trap deuterium themselves. They hold it to themselves, which allows them to proliferate. And I think that links to the fact that deuterium, excess deuterium causes cancer. And I think you believe that. And you have a, a new paper out that I think was a long time coming. I think you were studying these people for many, many years, uh, pancreatic cancer, and showing that uh, deuterium depleted water could actually uh, improve their, uh, their lifespan. These were people with fourth stage pancreatic cancer, a paper you shared with me recently um, that is, I thought was really interesting. It, it, we, we published this paper in Cancer Control. It's Dr. Shomia is a paper with collaboration with the Lundquist Institute and the Department of Pediatrics at UCLA. That's my home base. But practically, we showed that you can multiply the survival time uh, in even inoperable pancreatic cancer. It, these patients were inoperable, meaning that our surgeons, they just kind of, they could just look around in that abdomen after opening these patients. And uh, my colleague, Dr. Dula Farkas, uh, was uh, the lead surgeon in this study, meaning that um, they were able to confirm that these patients are inoperable, but they still lived uh, out by years of their unfortunate peers who 
um, have died, unfortunately, sooner. Usually, they with this advanced advanced stage of the disease, they only live about six months to a year, and we were able to extend their life for several years and. At least they lived as long as we show this in the paper because we had to terminate the study. We had to present the study in uh, San Diego in 2014 at the American Association for Cancer Research meeting. So we collected the data and we, we didn't kick patients out of the study. We just collected the data and presented the data. But uh, uh, with inner and uh, contemporary technologies, which are cell impedance assays, this 13 syllable glucose studies, which we developed with um, a number of my colleagues, Dr. Rehan, Dr. Yi, and, and some other colleagues at Harvard UCLA, we were able to show that uh, uh, deuterium depletion in uh, cancer, in, in uh, pancreatic cancer cell lines. Uh, improves mitochondrial functions and improves uh, uh, metabolic water recycling. And that made a big difference as far as the survival time. Uh, and and it's, it's quite dramatic uh, from the clinical assessment of uh, how you can actually add to conventional therapies with some between depletion in the form of either water or between depleted ketogenic diets and clinicians can talk of that uh, simply because uh, now we have enough data and we have clinicians who practice uh, these uh, scenarios, these deuterium depleting scenarios. And now there's information out there with great resources, with great summits, uh, where you can actually listen to basic scientists, physicians, clinicians, um, naturopathic doctors uh, who, who practice these fields and, and they actually learn as they go. But, but patients are, I would say, um, clinically evaluated from their survival and quality of life and their duty and depletion also. So I think we're, we're supposed to go for an hour. Is that right, Sue? Sue? We should finish up, <laughs> we should wrap up. It's actually for two hours, so you can go as long as you want, but it's important oh. so we can, well, as long as you want, but it's, long, it's important that we translate this for our viewers, like what can we do to prevent the damage from deuterium? Where can we get this deuterium depleted water? Exactly, that was what I was gonna ask. In the next. feed, that we should have a low liquid diet. I mean, so, you know, so what can we as the listeners, and I'm, profess to be very ignorant in this topic, so it's fascinating. What can we do to use this information to help our health? That's all. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> there are two ways of, well, there are several ways of improving um, deuterium depletion for our bodies or uh, helping our body to deplete deuterium. And that, improve, that includes lifestyle, uh, diet, and what type of geographical um, locations we consider for our, to be at our house and what type of lifestyle and act, physical activities we perform and what additional treatments. And it can cover from chiropractors to massage therapies, which restore muscle function. And for that matter, to uh, help our body to deplete deuterium through muscle functions and uh, being able to um, generate this deuterium depleted water in our body, in our system. Now diet is very important simply because this is how we control the tomb content of our mitochondrial matrix well. And in just the very general sense of how the system works, um, fatty acid beta oxidation delivers the most efficient, <clears throat> the most amount, the, the largest amount of metabolic water to our mitochondria. And this is simply, uh, easy to calculate from one kilogram of, of water, one pound of uh, <clears throat> ketogenic, let's say, diet or bacon, just be very practical, which is grass-fed, which is coming from grass-fed 
uh, animals uh, that includes cows, uh, pork if you eat pork meat or or any uh, poultry or, or or so on. Uh, of the fat, one kilogram of the fat or one pound of that fat of those animals, you can generate 1.1 pounds or 1.1 kilograms of lithium depleted water, <clears throat> provided that the animals are from pastures and, and also from, uh, from their natural uh, habitat. Um, and it's a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diet means that at least uh, 60, 70% of your calorie intake uh, come from uh, fat, uh, animal fat is the, the most, uh, I would say, beneficial in uh, oxidizing and gaining low lithium metabolic water, uh, saturated, long-chain saturated fat. And now I think there's a broad consensus even by professional uh, organizations in the United States that fat is not bad at all. Uh, in fact, fat is good for you. It's much better than carbohydrates or sugars, especially processed sugars. And uh, uh, drinking excessively water is also not a very good idea when it comes to medical biochemistry. These are not medical advice. This, this is practically very basic uh, kind of biochemical consideration. Uh, you have to be careful with drinking water simply because the water that is, that is available uh, from various sources are high in lithium or higher in lithium than, than rainwater is or fractionated water is. And drinking excessively uh, this uh, environmental or um, water that is available in, in like in the stores they, they do two things. One, they load the tumor in your system and they also downregulate your ADH or antidiuretic hormone level, which is actually important both for mitochondrial functions. So usually now patients, if you order labs and you ask them for antidiuretic hormone measurements, the labs, they're gonna report very low value simply because the general population is drinking too much water. Um, without being thirsty. Um, and thirst is just as important as being sleepy or being hungry. That regulates how much food you take in and that regulates how much you sleep. If you, you, if you are not thirsty, you shouldn't be drinking anything simply because you can introduce the term in your body. If you are not hungry, then you should not be eating simply because your body does not need food uh, to be oxidized. So practically these basic needs of our body are regulated uh, through hormones and through our senses, but those are also there to protect you from deuterium. And uh, <clears throat> because of the risk, every time you eat, every time you drink, there's always a risk of incorporating or taking or bringing deuterium in your body you have to be careful what you eat, what you drink, and how much you exercise. Because exercise comes in and breathing techniques come in, how much oxygen you supply uh, for your body and how efficiently you can generate lithium depleted water from the pasture food or from the natural food source that you consume. You can actually, you can, you can control how efficiently you produce water simply because oxygen is there to, to generate water. So if, if with light exercise with uh, clean air, uh, with certain breathing patterns, uh, you can assist your body to produce metabolic water very efficiently. And also with, with uh, good sleep, with the dark cycle in the dark, um, with um, light regulation and, and circadian rhythm and also with melatonin production, you can regulate your sleep cycle because sleeping is practically to restore your lower deuterium level in your brain, which accumulates during the daytime simply because you're eating food. So practically sleep is nothing else, just, just pushing your body into a metabolic ketosis and depletes sufficiently deuterium so your brain can rest uh, a little bit from all the deuterium that it needs to consume. And the reason for that is about 25% of our brain, what the brain oxidizes have to be glucose. 
and that fraction is uh, coming from carbohydrates simply because the brain needs a uh, anaplorotic or, or a substrate that can provide neurotrans neurotransmitters and resupply the TC cycle for the uh, negative balance of uh, producing carbon balance of producing uh, neurotransmitters that leave the cell, even though they recycle it, it's not very efficient all the time. Uh, so practically your brain is exposed to 25% hydrogen glucose all the time. So you need rest of your brain functions and you have to push your body into ketosis to get rid of deuterium from your brain uh, in your sleep cycle. So even though the first four, few hours of sleep is practically muscle movements and, and, and intense uh, uh, muscle exercise in some sense, so you, you, you consume your glucose very efficiently from the circulation, and then your body is going to provide ketone bodies, beta hydroxy, butyrate, uh, to supply your brain with low deuterium substrates. And once you reach a certain deuterium threshold uh, or set point, then you wake up. And if you go on a deuterium depleting ketogenic diet, then you usually need less sleep. Uh, this is what we see in wild animals. They only sleep a few hours. And uh, for that reason, um, and they are not sleeping as deep as in nature, it's very dangerous. So taking deuterium in, only humans can afford that. Uh, they developed all kinds of industrial processes just to do, just to do so. Um, unfortunately, it affects our general health. It affects our general well-being in that sense. And uh, we need to make sure we actually adopt to this, to this particular uh, exposure of deuterium from the environment. And all that you can, as far as eating natural grass-fed food source, uh, try to be in the keto on the ketogenic side. And in the meantime, do light exercise at least, so you can actually use your muscles to produce more uh, uh, deuterium depleted water for your whole body. Uh, that's what we consider a good approach to deplete deuterium in general. Uh, there are many sources of deuterium depleted water. Uh, I think the cheapest and the easiest is filter rainwater, simply because rainwater is deuterium depleted because of this physical process of fractionating uh, uh, or getting rid of deuterium in the steam or in the vapor. And once you condense that uh, resulting water is going to be deuteriumly depleted. This is why high altitude uh, people live longer and are happier simply because they are exposed to less deuterium in their drinking water, in their crops as well. And uh, there are various source of, uh, sources of deuterium depleted water. I, I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, recommend any particular brand. There are at least three or five uh, brands that are in the market. Um, Light water is a good one, uh, Preventa, Claridia, and, and there are a number of other uh, deuterium depleted water sources, but they are all worth of considering um, at least just to get introduced this particular product line. But again, Drinking is not as important as, as nutritional approaches. So um, I think after all, or you don't have to drink at all. Um, I think last week or two weeks ago, I had this keto kind of boost my system. I haven't, I didn't drink water for uh, four days. And you can do that just simply just eating fat or a good ketogenic diet. But if you are thirsty, then you should drink water. Indeed, you should drink enough water to key your thirst. And if that's the scenario, then any of these deuterium depleted water uh, sources are good. Now, if you have to therapeutically deplete deuterium, there are very low deuterium content water and you should follow some of the doctors, some of the natural, naturopathic doctors who practice deuteronomics 
or loaded to your medicine, um, you should ask them what would be a very low deuterium content. We usually go down as 85 parts per million. The oceanic water is 155 parts per million. And there are various um, water products that are lower in deuterium. Therapeutically, they can be and should be used, uh, but that's always under the guidance of a trained licensed physician or naturopathic doctor or um, um, alternative or innovative approaches and doctors simply because um, sometimes you have to go quicker, sometimes you have to go faster. For recreational purposes, for heart maintenance, uh, I think, again, it's a biochemistry view, uh, medi medical biochemistry type of approach, but practically you can just eat deuterium depleted water in the form of uh, bacon. And when you're thirsty, you may just drink some deuterium depleted water. But the most important is just what type of diet you consume. If it's grass fed and it's coming from animal fat from the an interiors. So kidney, liver, a brain, bone marrow, those are actually, um, I think in Los Angeles, you can go camping out. There's one uh, on, on Wilshire, there's a grass-fed food store, but now you can actually almost all major food stores would give you um, grass-fed um, animal meat. Um, they are a little bit more expensive, but you don't have to eat as much. Um, I only eat once a day, bigger meals, um, and that is usually in the evening, but that, those are definitely ketogenic approaches or ketogenic diet. So it's it's a good bone marrow soup or it's a good bone marrow type of food or it's uh, with some salads, obviously, because you have to also consume some greens, but that's up to your taste. Um, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not, or I'm not beyond meat or anything. Those are high in supposedly or how they produce those may not be as friendly as, as uh, people think so, but that's those are just simple biochemical um, scenarios that we are now researching actively to make uh, heart data recommendations or that are most um, in line with medical biochemistry and these nanomolar functions in our systems. Low deuterium is definitely a uh, desirable trend and uh, supported by medical biochemistry arguments. And <clears throat> what is also important is that uh, uh, when you uh, plan your diet, when you plan your lifestyle, when you uh, consider integrating a deuterium depleting approach uh, to your everyday um, lifestyle and, and, and habits, consider all of them in the same time. It's it's really um, the best way of doing this is practically understanding how bad deuterium is and stay away from it. Um, then your body has a much better ability and your body has much better capacities and much improved ways of depleting deuterium in natural and using natural biochemical reactions. And I think after all, this is the practical practicality is, I think the desirable would be just as food contains the calories and the carbohydrates and the iron con contents and so on, food should have a label on the back, um, which gives you the deuterium content of the food itself. So you can pick, you can make your choice of, of what you would eat. Unfortunately, carbohydrates and sugars and sweets are addictive. so. It's not always your decision what you eat uh, because your addiction kind of kicks in. Uh, but again, if you understand these relationships uh, between these, um, among these nutrients and their deuterium content, I think after all, you are able to make the right choice or to give the right recommendation. Again, based on the clinical scenarios, I'm not a clinician, so I don't deal with patients but I, I work with a number of excellent uh, scientists and, and clinicians and naturopathic doctors who are able to deliver uh, solid information in the field. And now as 
with Dr. Sanaf as we learn deuteronomics together and we kind of discuss topics and we kind of entertain certain models and, and challenges. Uh, after all, we just kind of getting almost, uh, you know, just scientifically and clinically and, and as far as translational medicine goes, we just know what to do. And uh, <clears throat> we can kind of relate this information to clinicians and these clinicians can relate these patients, uh, these uh, uh, scenarios, this in, these information to patients. You mentioned grass-fed many times, and I think it's, has it been shown that grass-fed foods have lower deuterium than for the cows, the CAFO cows, cows that are eating the GMO around our bready corn and soy type of diet or? Well, there was a very interesting papers in animal, in frontiers of animal sciences that <clears throat> actually <clears throat> in the farm setting, in the industrial farm setting, they don't grass feed, they don't let these animals to, 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 to eat to eat from the pasture, they actually give them corn right. and so on. And uh, they have very little grass access to various, so they are sick. They, they have liver disease. <clears throat> they have, they, are, they actually their temperature increases. They're, they call it the stomach temperature, the fasting temperature of the cows uh, because their body temperature increases on corn and soy supplements, which are wow. sugar and protein and starch. And the reason for that is uh, that if you look at mitochondria, there are two ways of the protons that are coming from food. There are two ways of getting into the matrix from the intermembrane space. One is through the nanomotors. One is through these ATP synthase nanomotors that is only available if the animals have low deuterium in their food. If they have high deuterium in their food, then these heat producing uncoupling proteins will be more active because they are able to process deuterium more efficiently. And these animals are gonna have a higher body temperature simply. <clears throat> deuterium can transfer your mitochondria into more like a brown uh, adipose tissue type of metabolism. So they don't use nanomotors, they rather use these uncoupling proteins. So you still have oxygen consumption, you still have metabolic water production, which is loaded with deuterium, but you don't have ATP synthesis. So uh, looking at the, if you talk to a farmer who uses industrial procedures and feeds their cows with uh, sugar, starch, and, and uh, protein supplements in the form of especially GMO soybean, those animals have fever practically. Mm. So their nutrition is not very efficient. Their, their products are high in deuterium. So consuming those, especially, you know, deliver those to children uh, when it comes to school lunch and school bags, it's, it's lunch bags. It's, <clears throat> it's practically uh, just not a very healthy scenario in my, in my consideration. So uh, you, you should, shoot for you should start considering grass-fed low deuterium uh, source of food <clears throat> that you you can actually just kind of um, stay away from products of, of, of metabolically diseased animals who are actually put on a diet that is not their natural diet so of course they're going to get sick <clears throat> and the people who would, who eat their products <clears throat> excuse me, going, going to be sick. So I think a lot of the chronic diseases, uh, a lot of the chronic uh, um, uh, metabolic diseases, uh, cellular level metabolic diseases like cancer, diabetes, obesity, the metabolic syndrome, um, and all that come with it, it's just, uh, those are just practically uh, deuterium related um, population diseases, and they should be approached after so many failing uh, medical approaches, they should be approached by the team from the angle of the team depletion. And as we can see the beneficial effects individually, I think we could make a great impact in, in, in public health issues uh, much more efficiently if we would start dealing with the team on, on social levels. But practically, it's, it's as you said, 
It's, it's just a very important aspect of how we feed our animals, our livestock, and, and what we gain from them as far as our heart goes. And, and this is, I think, a very new, very exciting, and a very important field of medicine just to explore the gene depletion to um, improve public health in general. And I would uh, obviously want to comment that those uh, CAFO cows are eating GMO Roundup Ready corn, corn and soy, <clears throat> which is going to be loaded with glyphosate. And glyphosate has many papers have shown that glyphosate disrupts the mitochondria. And I think it does so through, in part, through messing up the proteins that are in charge of making sure the mitochondria have low deuterium. So I think glyphosate is really very much linked to deuterium toxicity. In the animals and in the people who eat the animals, because that's going to be the foods derived from the animals are also going to be contaminated with glyphosate if they're getting exposed. <clears throat> so, what do you think of glyphosate altering red blood cell metabolism, where actually the um, diphosphoglycerol uh, binds to uh, the oxygen binding site uh, to kick oxygen off the? It, it can be defective. Uh, on, on red blood cells as well. I well, red G6PD, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase, as you know, is very active in the red blood cells. And they use that enzyme through that pathway to produce and uh, to resupply NADPH to the entire system. And so when uh, it's been shown uh, experimentally that glyphosate suppresses glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. And that makes sense to me because it has um, critical glycine residues at places where it binds multiple phosphate containing uh, substrates. And that's the pattern that I see of the type of enzyme that glyphosate disrupts. So it fits my model, which is based on how glyphosate disrupts EPSP synthase in the uh, shikimate pathway. That's the way it kills the, the weeds and also the gut microbiome. So it's, um, it's all connected together. Glyphosate is messing up the gut micro microbial balance messing up the whole system that manages depletion of deuterium in the gut and messing up the mitochondria in the liver and every, probably everywhere in the body, messing up the uh, red blood cells ability to re reproduce, uh, to resupply NADPH, which is so critical for glutathione to get uh, brought down from its oxidized state. So when you have your, and, and experimentally it's been shown the glyphosate reduces the, the amount of glutathione in the liver and also causes the glutathione to be oxidized so the ratio of the oxidized to the reduced form is too high. You need the NADPH in order to convert glutathione back to its reduced form so that it can act as an antioxidant. So there's all these different complex things that are going on in the body when you're exposed to glyphosate. And so I think the, the CAFO cows are exposed to glyphosate and it's messing up their mitochondria, causing them then not to be able to uh, to have a healthy metabolism um, and therefore not to be able to produce healthy foods both in terms of deuterium and in terms of glyphosate contamination. I would like to just comment here. Um, in Hungary, where Dr. Boros is from, I visited the Pustai family who was uh, you know, incremental and in, you know, exposing issues with GMO. And uh, they told me that there were no genetically modified uh, foods there. They would not allow them. And she, his wife, was in the room of a Hungarian minister and Hillary Clinton and the American ambassador to Hungary in tow came in, I wanna to talk to you about GMOs. And he said, not here. And they just mm -hmm. really abruptly got up and left. So cheers to Hungary. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's a wonderful story. Yeah, it's, it's, it's prohibited to produce anything that is GMO uh, here in Hungary. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, true of many areas in Europe in general, uh, countries can individually regulate their GMO um, uh, crop, but Hungary does not allow, it's against the law to grow anything that is GMO. And uh, uh, we actually try to even live without chemicals, meaning that uh, uh, certain areas of, of Hungary uh, do have uh, laws that limit not only GMO, but also uh, chemicals. And, and for that matter, uh, there are some really good quality of, of uh, food. Uh, we, we do have, um, and we do know uh, um, farmers or, or natural 
uh, farmers that or grass land farmers who only feed their animals with natural somor um, farm is one of these uh, I think best quality meat I, I, I think if you really want to deplete deuterium uh, you can consider pot oats meat uh, some more meat and there are some others uh, feature meat which are actually natural growers if you come and visit um, uh, to Hungary then uh, there are a, a line of excellent and high quality products with low deuterium um, that you can actually just explore for your own health and benefits. And, and you can actually feel uh, or you can sense the difference very quickly uh, simply because Hungary has also livestock which are native to the country and they would not eat anything other than just their natural habitat. They are very kind of hard to grow them or they are not as fast uh, in grown and producing products as farm-raised animals or industry-based uh, technologies, <clears throat> but they are very healthy. They are very tasty. They are extremely nutritious. And um, if you know how to eat these, these products, then they are not even more expensive simply because you don't have to eat as much. You don't have to eat a half bowl of cereal in the morning. You can have just a little piece of sausages, which is made of these native Hungarian animals. There's the gray cow. Uh, there's this uh, Hungarian water buffalo population. They, they, they just like to be in their natural environment and they produce high quality good meat. And for that matter, I think it's a good um, well, kind of way of exploring deuterium depletion through uh, food. If you visit this part of Europe, then you can actually just explore this for your own health. But it's, it's, it's actually just very quick and a, and a sure way of, of improving your heart and find resources and find grown methods and techniques that these, these uh, um, animal and agriculture experts or people who actually really study biochemistry or actually explore the beneficial effects of, of these natural growing and, and pasturing methods, uh, they actually can give you some extremely good quality products that serves your health for that matter. So Laszlo, you have, getting back to deuterium, you have talked about how much deuterium is in different kinds of foods. And I know you've done some measurement of how much deuterium, you know, in sugar or in cottage cheese. And I've heard some numbers for some things. Maybe, maybe the audience would be interested in knowing, you know, which foods have high and which foods have low deuterium so they could kind of figure out yeah, the so diet. The, the rule is that we have the, the highest, well, as reference range, um, the highest like deuterium content is of the oceanic water, which is 155 parts per million. That means every million hydrogen would have 155 deuterium among them. And uh, food, uh, as we go from, uh, again, just, just from the natural environment, if you look at flour or, or sugar or carbohydrates, they come, they go from 155 to like 152 and 148 parts per million. If you actually eat proteins or, or, or um, um, food that is rich in, in proteins, they may go down to 142 parts per million. And uh, once you get down to the oil and fat based diets, then you're going to start dropping the tumor more significantly below 135 ppm. And uh, once you eat more natural grass fed or pastured animals, then their various products, for example, their fat products or saturated fatty acids, especially at certain um, carbon positions, they can have as low as 110 ppm or even below 100 uh, parts per million, uh, meaning that uh, your biological systems or our biological systems are very um, 
um, uh, kind of gradually they drop the team once you go from the environmental water down to the carbohydrates and proteins and then down to the fatty acid deuterium levels those are at least 25 to 30 percent decreases and drops so um, again we have to measure them and Dr. Shomya, my colleague, um, they measured it uh, through uh, technologies using isotope ratio mass spectrometers, but MRI is also a, a great tool, a great diagnostic tool to, um, to measure the tumor uh, in, in, in living organisms uh, and very quick for that matter. Um, you can, I'm not gonna spare the beans simply because um, there are, now analytical efforts to produce uh, like the tomb content of food um, that is available. Uh, uh, but, but again, um, uh, truly, truthfully, it's just practically how much fat you eat and how natural that fat is. That's how you deplete your tomb, but it can go from 155 ppm all the way down to, let's say one, 12 ppm, which is a good natural source ghee, for example, uh, that is this um, uh, milk product that is fat practically. It's, it's uh, um, part of the biologically available low deuterium fat components. Um, and you can actually use uh, saturated animal interior fat that is also low in deuterium and when you oxidize it into metabolic water, your mitochondria can produce the tumor depleted metabolic water very easily. And it's just the measurements are currently being carried out. We do have now data uh, that with some great surprises. Uh, for example, fish is not as low as we thought so. Uh, even like saltwater fish is not as low as we thought so. Uh, some of the vines are very high in deuterium. Uh, those are plant products or, or fruit products. Um, and uh, some of the drinks like beer are very high in deuterium. That's practically, again, because they are coming from plant sources and especially fruits are very high in deuterium. That's why we shouldn't eat fruits, especially out of the season. Um, and uh, that's why we respond to fruit because of the high sugar and the tomb level with some psychological changes. This kind of sugar high is a very known phenomenon, especially in pediatrics. Uh, when kids eat or drink a lot of uh, fruit juices, they get practically very active and very high from them. It's also, the, those are also addictive because of their taste. And uh, so that um, when it comes to food, it's, it's usually um, those four or five basic tastes that we can, uh, we can taste of food. It's sweet is the most addictive and it's the most encouraging for that matter. And the animals, they protect themselves because of the seasonality of the fruits and because they compete for it so hard, but in human nutrition, actually, they became more common and more abundant simply because they are available from various sources. If you go to the food section of the supermarket, you can practically buy anything, even from countries and lands that are not really local or uh, they are imported from various parts of the world that are not really like your natural diet or habitats. So practically you have to be very careful of what the tutum content of the food that you consume and the best way to judge that, the best way just to look at it is simply just get the basic food item, do some research on food tutum content which are available in my talks and also in Dr. Gabor Shomiri's talks. And, and now there are podcasts about the team. There are many podcasts about the team nowadays. And uh, uh, you can, unfortunately, some of them are almost like many of them are somewhat hard to 
kind of evaluate from the science and from the clinical medicine point of view. Um, but you can go to various websites where you can learn um, about the team content and the team in general. I do have a website, uh, which is uh, laszlogboros.com. Um, there's Dr. Petra, Petra Dorsman's website uh, at uh, um, drpetrad.com. She has a very thorough, detailed uh, description of deuterium and the biological and clinical roles in certain food components. There is, uh, there are, as I mentioned, various uh, water companies, Preventa, Light Water, Claribia, and some, you know, many others. Uh, they have information about uh, deuterium content of their products, which is a good resource, a good source of information about those. Uh, uh, Preventa, Dr. Gabo Shomiai, he also performs and pays and invests in research and science. Uh, if you uh, want to know more about deuterium depletion in the form of water and food, um, you, can, uh, you can have academic papers now there are more and more of those in the medical literature that you can explore. You can just type in deuteronomics uh, or deuterium uh, with the names of the investigators and they would pop up some great results and some great resources. Um, there are <clears throat> various papers that we wrote with our co-authors about, uh, for example, science, uh, um, neuro-oncology, there are some great papers out there with very thorough information about deuterium. So, so there are resources out there. You can do your own investigation nowadays. You just have to type in some keywords. Deuterium is one of those. Deuterium depletion is, or depletion, which is the kind of the made up word for uh, deuterium depletion is DEU depletion, uh, which will give you great results. So, so after all, there is a way of doing your own homework and, and finding out your own interest in this whole field, but definitely it's coming. Uh, it was hard to see five, maybe 10 years ago where the field is gonna go um, in some and by some opinions uh, this decade, uh, the 220 to 230 is gonna be the time of, of deuteronomics uh, simply because there's more and more clinical applications. There are more and more um, uh, translational uh, relevances and, and, and clinical trials and clinical work addressing deuterium in various biological systems. Um, we, are, we just started collaborating with um, the, the Vrij University of Amsterdam, and uh, we are developing analytical tools. We are developing a deuterium database. Um, James Lack is a, a great colleague of us who is helping us with some of the analytical um, uh, studies and you know, being very interactive and, and very open to all kinds of initiatives we are, we are applying for, for grants uh, to study deuteronomics in Alzheimer's disease. I think those are very um, important uh, new developments uh, and dementia in general. Uh, we are also working with armed forces to improve their mental abilities, their focusing and so on using ketogenic diets and deuterium depletion. So these are all in the works. Um, I think we established a great deal of science behind the team depletion. Thanks Dr. Senef and our clinician friends. Um, and um, uh, just, uh, if you need to know more, you can ask or go to the, those resources, those websites. And, and I think now there's a lot more information out there than you would expect after all. And uh, there are business arms, there are business, there are companies who are delivering and improving these methodologies, technologies, water quality, and 
availabilities. Um, we are talking to foundations. We, we are talking to patients. The Herzberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research did help us tremendously in our research and in our quest. Uh, and so is the University of California with their um, um, research projects and, and uh, infrastructure that has been uh, that have been available for the genomics type of research and myself being an editor and also reviewer for these efforts I think um, after all there is just so much to learn uh, and those are now very well designed studies very uh, prominent uh, investigators and scientists are involved in these genomics type of efforts uh, there are great workshops and podcasts. There is a deuterium depletion summit. There is a, in Hungary, in Budapest, in every two, three years, we do have a deuterium depletion conference uh, organized by Dr. Gabor Shomiri and HID. Uh, that's practically the, the main resource in Europe and, and, and uh, was the groundbreaking effort just to deliver science and deuteronomics and deuterium depletion to the medical and the scientific communi communities. But now the Yale University radiology investigators from Florida, from, from Holland, uh, from Germany, um, and uh, maybe uh, some other very important clinical and, and research institutes from, from various other, other countries, they are now trying to incorporate deuteronomics and deuterium depletion in their own clinical and, and translational science and research efforts. And uh, we all learn from each other. I love the kind of the information that goes around and all the experts who pitch in and, and they have various approaches, lots of questions, but eventually if you deal with this enough, long enough, and you put your time, effort and mind to it, you can learn a, a great deal about deuteronomics. You may get even addicted a little bit, just like, <laughs> but I'm not the only one, Dr. Senef. <laughs> can I ask a question? Is there um, is there any age related ability or or lo loss of ability in in um, shall we say uh, eliminating deuterium from your body? Uh, no, definitely not. You can uh, start as late or as early as you want. No, I mean, your do children do do children eliminate it better than old people? Well, they have a different deuterium metabolism or deuterium biochemistry. They actually accumulate, they get rid of less deuterium than adults would. Mm -hmm. They retain some deuterium for their rate of growth and for, for their, but, but it's all related to our biological needs. And uh, because of their body temperature, because of their sleep patterns, because of their physical activities, they, they have a different deuterium metabolism and and because of their growth um, they process the tomb differently and once we grow up once we have to slow down cellular growth and and uh, proliferation then we apply a different kind of deuterium metabolism pattern but it's a very good question it, it changes throughout life it changes even overnight when you sleep your deuterium content Aging has a great component when it comes to deuterium. I think historically biblical times, those longer life patterns are very much related to the lower deuterium exposure and because of the lower deuterium in the environment and because of the food that they were eating and the lifestyle. So um, eventually we're gonna understand, we don't understand all the details, we don't know all the specifics, but, uh, you know, as more people get involved and start researching uh, deuteronomics, I think we will have answer to everybody. As so far, deuteronomics never let me down. Um, I think this is, as a scientist, as a physician, as a trained uh, scientist who have been publishing and reviewing and so on, 
I think the most rewarding type of knowledge that I can I could gather, develop, obviously with colleagues together, it's due to genomics simply because uh, biochemistry makes a lot more sense. It's a lot easier. Uh, it's actually fun to study, uh, which I never heard from medical students uh, studying <laughs> biochemistry. That's like so much fun. Once you understand, it's actually there for controlling deuterium and replacing hydrogens or potentially deuterium from biomolecules. It's a whole different game. And from learning, um, just like what we had to learn and what we had to publish and model and, and try, for them, it's much easier to review these scenarios. Uh, we love working with kids because once they get the hang of it, um, they become, it, it becomes part of their studies, part of their life, part of like how they approach um, their research task or, or whatever their interest is. Deuteronomics kind of pitches in always a different view, a different angle and a different corner of your kind of knowledge base that you can apply and you can spread out and you can, you can just use it for various purposes that may serve your heart or healing process or make some life uh, changing, especially nutritional lifestyle related decisions. But in fact, there's every age has a different kind of deuterium metabolism scenario. Again, there's a lot more research to do, but uh, it, it's after all, it's all about deuterium in my view. Well, I'd like to open it up to questions and we do have a hand up. So raise your hands and we'll go in that order. So the first question goes to Sheridan. So please unmute yourself and ask. Hi, Dr. Boros. Fascinating information. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so you just said something ab about depletion overnight. So fasting does deplete deuterium in the body. Is that correct? If you burn fat, low deuterium fat or ket ketone bodies, which have natural low deuterium, then it would actually deplete deuterium in your body. Yes, indeed. Okay. So that leads me to another question and I'm gonna combine somebody else's question in the chat. So they asked about a, a ketogenic diet and a low carbohydrate diet to suppress advanced stage cancer. So I'm wondering if you could tie that also into um, just answering. So do you think that's why um, the, meta, uh, the metabolic approach to cancer or keto for cancer, do you think deuterium is actually the mechanism of why that works? Yeah, after all, it is. Um, and I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, Dr. Seif Seyfried's work and uh, Dr. Agostino. Actually, uh, I got in touch with them because I think they started a great uh, research efforts simply introducing ketosis into chemical or into uh, scientific and, and uh, medical procedures. But the ultimate mechanism, how and why their diet works and why their lifestyle change recommendations work is practically to do tumor depletion. So the mechanism of and uh, as a foundation of all those uh, clinical results is after all, it's, it's uh, because of deuterium depletion. If a ketogenic diet fails in the clinic is because the source of the ketogenic diet is from process source. And we published this in neuro-oncology. And this has been a great exchange of idea with the Yale team of radiologists. So uh, yeah, it's a great question. Yes, you're right. Uh, it's, it's, it's all the tumor depletion after all, and uh, mitochondrial functions are there, and that's Dr. Thomas Seyfried's work. Uh, mitochondrial functions are there to produce metabolic water, which is the tumor depleted. Uh, once you improve mitochondrial functions, then you are able to deplete the tumor more efficiently, so that's how you deal with cancer. After all, water that you produce in mitochondria because of the malic acid shadow, it gets out of the cytoplasma and it becomes part of your DNA. And aneuploidy is the driving force behind cancer or unregulated 
or dysregulated uh, cellular proliferation. And if you deplete deuterium in cancer cells, this aneuploidy, this, this constantly grown, instable, um, hard to repair type of DNA with multiple chromosomes, with, with nuclear abnormalities or mosaicism, that's practically how you control these processes through deuterium depletion. So in restoring mitochondrial functions is practically how you deplete the tumor most efficiently. And this changes the uh, cancer uh, cellular phenotype. Uh, but it's a great question. Yes, the underlying mechanism behind all these is deuterium depletion. Okay. And then my final quick question is, um, is there, a, there's a little bit of chat also in, um, in the question and answer chat. Um, people are talking about using home distillation processes for creating. My understanding is that it's more complex than that. Can you, can you comment? Is there a home um, process to create your own deuterium depleted water or, or not? Listen, everybody is trying to, once they get the hang of this deuterium depletion high importance, they try to produce it at home. It's probably the most expensive way of producing water that is not depleted, deuterium depleted enough to achieve any benefits. So, and it's costly too. So you, you just, just imagine if you want to use a freezing technique, how many times you have to open and close your refrigerator door just to measure the water temperature, just to get this top layer, frozen layer, heavy water, just to remove it from it's, or if you want to distill it, you have to pay for gas, electricity, it doesn't matter what it is. And it's still not sufficient to achieve a therapeutic effect. So the best way and the cheapest way, um, and I'm not a businessman, uh, trust me, I'm, I'm, I'm really not promoting here to deplete the deplete of water, I'm a medical biochemist, but if you want to deplete the deuterium through water, then it's better if you buy it, simply because right. those companies know exactly how to produce this in mass quantities, the cheapest, and they are the most precisely positioned and measured and quality controlled metabolic water, uh, deuterium depleted water that matches your metabolic water. Using your refrigerator, your kitchen heater, or your gas stove and your distiller, dist distiller it's never gonna give you the precision and the quality that you need to achieve therapeutic effects or just to be comfortable that the water is really what you want to drink. Uh, so I always recommend just, you know, eat ketogenic or pasture grass fed uh, ketogenic food, sleep well, exercise, and we are, when you're thirsty, buy that water from a known resource and company and, and, and and just be on the shore side. That's my, that's my opinion. Great, thank you so much. Of course. Any other questions or final conclusions? We'll go as long as the co-host can tolerate it. You know, they've got <laughs> but I need, I need to leave it at four, so. Okay, so any concluding comments or how would you like to round it up, Stephanie and Dr. Boros? Mm -hmm. He did a good job with what he just said. I just think that it's really fascinating to me that uh, I, I didn't know, I mean, I knew what deuterium was for a long time before I knew that it was an, a problem in metabolism. I didn't know that at all until last, you know, December, 2019. And it's just amazing that, um, I was amazed that I didn't know about it when it is so important. And I really believe it is crucial uh, in our metabolism and that we have toxic chemicals that are disrupting our ability to handle it correctly. And that's a, a huge part of many, many diseases that we face today, I believe. And it's a mitochondrial hit, you know, and you have mitochondrial uh, dysfunction is connected to so many diseases. Almost every disease you look at that's, you know, dramatically rising in our society is connected directly to mitochond mitochondrial dysfunction. It's so central to metabolism and deuterium is so central to the mitochondria. So it's just really, I think a wake up call. And I really hope that uh, 
it catches on. It's been a, you know, so it's interesting how these fields have just this very tight community of people who are studying it, trying to figure it out. And at some point it kind of breaks loose into the more general population. And I do hope that this is going to be the decade where deuterium becomes a household word, you know, that people become aware of it and, and of its importance and then of ways to try to make sure that you've managed it well in your, in your lifestyle. <clears throat> Uh, thank you so much. I think you said it all. It's uh, it's the future of biochemistry, medicine, and connect the two for a functional approach and to <coughs> just the currently devastating situation when it comes to public health. But the team will play a great role in this whole process. Well, I want to thank you, folks. I mean, for the wonderful presentation. We want to thank you so much. You want to come back anytime? You're more than welcome. So thank you very much. <laughs>